Hello. Hi, Cherish viewers. We are super excited to bring you your favorite Education USA information session. I am Rafia Tulawal, and I'll be your host for this session today. Education USA, for our first time viewers, is a US Department of State network of over 400 advising centers across the globe. And we are located in our 175 countries. If you are watching us today and you are interested in studying in the USA, then you are in the right place. I am super excited because today we have a very important guests in our midst and they'll be talking about liberal arts colleges. So um, let me talk a little bit, a bit more about Education USA. Um, in Ghana, we have two centers. Education USA is located in Kumasi and in Accra. In Accra, we are based at the US Embassy. So currently, all our programs are virtual. In Kumasi, we are located at Asukwa, to be precise. Um, ACE consults. Education USA has four advisors in Ghana, myself, Rafia Tulawal, uh, we have Mrs. Afote, and then we have Mrs. Owusu based in Kumasi and Miss Margaret. We, we are really excited that today we have um, three important guests. Um, they are in the presence of uh, Mr. Mendes, did I pronounce that right? Uh, we have Phoebe and then we have Andrew. They are actually representing three liberal arts colleges. I know at this point we'll be asking ourselves, what are liberal arts colleges? I'll leave that to our presenters. They'll tell us more. But please do not forget to uh, type in your comments or your questions in the comment section and let us know where you are reaching us from at this point i would hand over to andrew he'll tell us more about what liberal arts colleges are and the opportunities they have to offer us so please stay um stay tuned and listen to us thank you over to you andrew thank you so much rafiatu we appreciate our partnership with education usa um, my name is Andrew Moe. I'm the Director of Admissions at Swarthmore College, and I'll turn it over to Dean um, first, and then Phoebe. I am Dean Mendes, Associate Director of Admission here at Williams College. Nice to join you all today. Hi, I'm Phoebe. I'm an Assistant Dean here at Pomona College. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much for being here. We're going to share a presentation today, and we'll go over the agenda in just a moment. So let me Get that up here. All right, should load in just a moment here. Um, so this is first a map of our three institutions, uh, Pomona on the West Coast in California, Swarthmore and Williams on the East Coast. Swarthmore is in Pennsylvania and Williams is in Massachusetts. Um, we will be going through a presentation today um, that we hope is really helpful for you. So we're going to define the liberal arts and what makes liberal arts colleges really different from other institutions. Um, you have many choices in colleges and universities in the United States, and our institutions focus on undergraduate education. So if you are tuning in because you're interested in graduate programs, we generally don't offer graduate programs, but Education USA is a really wonderful resource if you have questions for them about graduate education. Um, we'll go through how to apply to our three institutions, um, the things that we're looking for. We'll also go through financial aid and scholarships, and just a preview, we give tremendous tremendous amounts of financial aid for undergraduate admitted students. Um, then we'll spend just a brief um, time with three of our institutions, um, going first with Pomona, then Swarthmore, then Williams. We'll try to spend around 15 minutes at the very end talking about, um, or excuse me, answering your questions that you might have. So thrilled to be with you, and I'm going to turn it over to Dean. 
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, again, uh, it's great to be here with you. And we're gonna talk about uh, the model of, of uh, education that the three of us represent in the United States. And the full name is actually the liberal arts and science. So we wanna make sure we put that science piece in there. And so why do they matter? What, what does this model, um, what is it all about? So in, in the slide before, it mentioned that 65% of, of students that are gonna work in fields that haven't um, been created yet. How do you how do you study that? How do you get a degree in, in a job that doesn't exist? Well, well, we believe that the liberal arts is the best way to go about this because you're going to have all of these skills that are listed on the slide. Those are the things that we really value. The liberal arts teaches you um, a well-rounded education that provides you with, with the breadth so that you can be skilled in many different areas so that you're not just focusing on one area of study, uh, we're gonna have you have these skills by the time you graduate so that you can think critically, you can, anal you can analyze things. Communication is a big part of that. Some of that comes with, with the size of our classes. Uh, most of us are gonna be smaller uh, schools, so you're gonna have more access to your professors. There's gonna be breadth where we're gonna ask you to study um, more than one discipline, or we're gonna ask you to study um, maybe the social sciences and the humanities and STEM, and you can maybe select the courses you want, but so that you're well-rounded and that you have the full volume of experiences so that by the time you leave, you will be able to adapt to a world that's always changing. And we believe the liberal arts model is the best way to go about that. You should also think about your learning style. What, what kind of style will make you successful? How do you learn? Do you need to have access to your professors? Do you need to have um, your voice heard in the classroom? Um, do you need to have a lot of support uh, that liberal arts colleges offer our students? So when we go on to, to the next slide, you can see some of the, the other characteristics of the liberal arts. So when I mentioned having breadth, we're gonna have lots of areas of study that students can, can connect with, can major in, can minor in. Many of our schools will have 40, 50, 60% of our students having a double major or a major and a minor. So lots of flexibility within that. You're not siloed in one department or one area of the college. You are free to move about and select courses in all areas of our colleges. So we're small, meaning we want to be small, um, maybe between 1,500 and 3,000, 3,500 on the larger end. Uh, we're small um, on purpose. We want to have you have access to our, our professors, to our, our class sizes are probably going to be 12, 13, 14 um, students in average class size so that you can have your voice heard. Um, you're gonna have discussion-based classes. You're gonna be able to, um, we're gonna hear your voice. We wanna hear your student voice. All of our classes are taught by professors, as Andrew mentioned, the majority of liberal arts and science colleges are gonna be undergraduate schools, which means we won't have, we won't have master's program. We won't have uh, those pre-professional programs for the most part as well. And all of our courses are gonna be taught by professors because we won't have graduate students there to teach. So that's a big benefit. It also means that our students are first in line to do research because there aren't graduate students ahead, ahead of them. So you're gonna have opportunities to get involved in research across all areas of study. You hear research, you might think of lab coats and test tubes, but research happens in the arts. It happens in the humanities as well. And our, our professors are there to, to do research and they're gonna need assistance. And many of our students get to do graduate level research during their time as an undergraduate um, student. So when we talk about discussion-based classes, seminar-style courses, we want students to facilitate uh, their discussion in the class, to have your voice heard, to talk about the reading, to talk about the problem set, um, to have a hands-on uh, experience in the classroom where you're not just consuming classes, you're engaged in those classes. There will be some that would be lecture-based, but the majority of classes at a liberal arts college are going to be discussion-based, seminar-style, 12 to 13, 14 person in a class where, where you can't hide in the back and not have your voice heard. So it makes you be prepared for every class. It, it forces you to, to get the work done because you're, you're gonna get called on. We wanna hear your voice. We wanna hear um, what you have to say about what's going on in that class. So that's a quick overview of, of kind of the characteristics of the liberal arts and science model. Thank you. Great, thanks Dean. Um, so you might be sitting here thinking, wow, that sounds really great. Um, I would love my voice to be really important in a classroom. 
room. How do I get admitted to selective institutions, right? The three of us are selective institutions, which means that we have a lot more applications than seats in the class. So we have to employ what's called holistic review. And holistic review means that there isn't just one element on this slide here that can get you admitted or keep you out. We're looking at all aspects of your application because the whole person, your personality, what you bring to the table, your perspectives, your educational history, your family history, all of those things make up you. Um, first and foremost, we're going to be looking at academic achievement. We want to ensure once once you arrive on our campus, you're engaged in our classrooms and in discussions and working with faculty and students that you can handle the academic work at our three institutions. So we're going to evaluate that based on usually a couple different things. One is national examination results. So if you're taking the West African examinations, you might be tuning in probably from West Africa and most likely from Ghana, but you might be coming from Nigeria or Liberia. We're going to look at West African examinations um, and we're going to look at how well you're doing compared to your peers, right? Your peers in your country and in the region. It's all contextual. We understand there are different um, examination results based on country and that sort of thing. If you're tuning in from further or maybe you're in the French system or the Lusophone system, um, we're going to understand that. So if your country employs national examinations, we're going to be looking at those. Um, we're also going to be looking at internal grades and marks, and that's through your transcript. We understand contextual factors. We understand that in some countries, high school or secondary school is only three years and not four years like in the United States. We will understand that. You do not need to worry about that. But we are going to be looking at how well you're doing over the course of time and your school counselor or a school official, headmaster, principal, assistant principal will submit that, that document to us. Um, the three of us represent, at least for now, test optional institutions, which means that for the upcoming year, at least, um, you will not need to submit the ACT or the SAT, um, and we don't require SAT subject tests, which have been discontinued in the United States and still available internationally. We understand that this might be a big barrier for you. Maybe you're not coming from Accra or Kumasi, where most of the test centers are located, right? Maybe you're coming from a different part of Ghana or a different part of West Africa, and you don't have access physically to a test center. Um, or you might not have the fees to pay for registration and you don't receive fee waivers, right? So we want to understand those barriers. And when we say it is optional, and even if you're applying for financial aid and scholarships, we mean it is optional. We're going to rely more on your academic achievement in the first two bullets on this slide. So don't worry about it if you think it's going to be a good reflection of your abilities you think that you have access to it and you want to take the SAT, by all means, you can submit it. There's no penalty in doing so, but if you don't have access to it, don't worry too much about that. We will also look at your, your writing samples. So usually this is in the form of your main essay. So to, to apply to our three institutions, you submit the common application, commonapp.org. Again, Education USA has resources for you to complete this, um, but it's one application for many different colleges and universities. And on the common application, you have one main essay. There are usually five or six prompts or questions that you have to answer. You choose one of those and write a compelling essay. The, the purpose of the essay is to get to know you. Who are you? Where do you come from? Where do you want to go in your life? Tell us an interesting story about you or snapshots in time. Um, it doesn't really matter what the topic is. There's lots of different ways that you could write this, but make sure that regardless of whatever you write, ensure that your personality is really coming through. Who are you? What are your perspectives, right? Because we want to picture you on our campus. We want to picture you in our classrooms. There are sometimes supplemental essays too. Each, each college is a little different, so you have to go onto our websites and look a little bit more at that. Um, sometimes there are, you know, a couple short answers, one second essay, um, but you do have to complete some of those things as well. Letters of recommendation are also required. Typically at our three institutions and at selective uh, institutions, that's we're going to be asking for a letter of recommendation from a school official. So sometimes that's a counselor or a psychologist, but it might just be, just be an English teacher, someone that you know really well who can submit your transcripts for you and usually will write a letter of recommendation. Um, and that letter of recommendation is about you in the context of your school and your community. 
And then we also are intentional about asking for at least one letter of recommendation from uh, a teacher, someone who has taught you inside of the classroom so that we can understand what kind of learner are you, um, what kind of student are you, are you the person to raise your hand all the time because you know the answer, or do you hang back a little bit, process information in a different way, are you a helper, do you help students who are struggling with a mathematics problem set, for example, so we need all kinds of different people at our three institutions. Um, personal achievements, talents, and activities. This is what we typically call extracurricular activities. So this could include school-sponsored activities. If you're on an athletic team, if you're part of the student government, or you're um, uh, part of a, you know, a, a church organization at your school, great. If you're part of something outside of school, that's totally fine as well. So maybe you are part of a community of faith, or maybe you work um, as an intern at Education USA, or you help take care of younger siblings or nieces and nephews who live with you, or elderly grandparents or parents with a um, a small business. Anything that you're doing outside of, of class, we want to know about it. Um, so please write about that or any awards or, or honors that you have. Um, and then finally, we have a couple of different options. So all three of us practice early decision. Early decision is a binding program. You are agreeing, this is my school. I really want to go to this college. You're my number one college, um, and, and this is the choice that I'm making. You're sort of putting all your eggs in one basket and saying, I don't care where else, else I get admitted. I'm really, really excited about Pomona College, and that's where I want to go. You can apply early decision. Um, you can only choose one for that round, so you have to choose one school. Um, there are relatively fewer applications coming in an early decision, so there might be some kind of advantage. Every college is a little different, though. It really is all about making that choice, though, and being really committed to that choice. Many of you will not know uh, in the next couple of months if you have a number one choice. Maybe you're like, these five colleges are all great for me. You don't need to apply early decision, and that's totally fine. Um, you can apply regular decision, and typically regular decision is due at the beginning of January. You have uh, you receive your decision usually at the end of March, and you have until around May 1st to make that decision. So you can compare financial aid from one college to the next, and you can um, do more research on that. So if you have more questions about early decision, feel free to ask us. Um, just know if you're a really savvy student, you know how this process works. We do not offer early action, which is a non-binding program at our three institutions. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phoebe. Sorry, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so now moving on to financial aid. So in terms of paying for college, um, there's a pretty widespread recognition that college in the United States is a really heavy investment. Um, it is something with which you can make change. And the hope of liberal arts colleges is that we are able to prepare students to get a really good return on that investment, that we are able to make adaptable thinkers in that way. The basics of financial aid are that we offer merit-based and need-based aid. Merit-based aid is based off of um, your scholarship. Have you been a strong student? Have you um, sought out strong rigor in whatever program you have been located in? Need-based aid is based on a family's financial need in order to attend a school. So if a school costs this amount, we'll go into this in a second, um, you would need this much money to be there. Um, I know different schools offer different types of awards in terms of talent scholarships as well, but these are the two primary types of aid that you will see at liberal arts colleges in the US. In your financial aid package, it will be built up of a few different pieces, starting with scholarships and grant money. Um, this is finances and basically grant money that is for you. It is from the institution in many cases, it is gifted, it is yours, you do not need to pay it back. Work study is a program through which there is a certain piece of your financial aid package that you would be expected to get from a job. So if you were working on campus, um, say as a tour guide in the admissions office, or if you were in a dining hall or a residence hall, something along those lines, work study would be the way um, you were able to um, have that portion of your financial aid through working regular hours in a campus job. And the final is loans. Loans are um, grants that you take out from uh, 
a provider of some description, this is money that you have to pay back once you have graduated. Um, there are many different providers. If you are interested specifically in talking with any of the financial aid counselors about which provider works well for you, those are counseling services that our financial aid offices do offer. And the final piece here is the financial aid application. So the CSS profile or the ISPA, um, both of these are documents that will just give us a snapshot of your family's finances. If there is um, any sort of situation with uh, you know, your family's assets or income, or you have another sibling who's hoping to go to college, that's all captured by these documents. It is how we calculate that need in need-based aid. It is how we calculate the amount of money that will come to you via scholarships and grants and everything along those lines. The basic formula here is the cost of attendance. So what we would expect a student would have to pay all the way down in terms of like your books, if you are going to be traveling or anything like that. Um, so all of that would go under cost of attendance. We subtract that from the number calculated through the CSS profile or the ISFA, the need that you would have. Um, and then that is what gives you, oh, sorry, the need that you would have um, and what you are actually able to pay would be your expected family and student contribution. And if you take that expected contribution away from your cost of attendance, that is the amount of need-based aid a school would provide. Oh, and we are moving right on to Pomona College. Excellent, okay. Um, so please let us know if there were any questions about those three sections, what is liberal arts as well as how to apply and financial aid. Um, but now we can talk a little bit about Pomona. Uh, Pomona is a small liberal arts college located in Southern California. Um, Pomona was founded in 1887. It was founded with the explicit mission of bringing a liberal arts and sciences education to the West Coast a type of education that focuses on breadth and depth. Um, you use a wide range of experiences to inform and complicate your understanding of a specific topic. Um, so you're bringing this really exploratory type of education to a place that was at the time and today heavily associated with innovation. California's state motto is Eureka, I found it. Um, and it is a place where you will find a lot of opportunities in multiculturalism, meeting new people, having new experiences. Um, we are so close to so many different like um, climates and biomes. Um, it's a very exciting place to be. If we zoom in even closer, we are a part of the Claremont Consortium, which is here in the city of Claremont. Um, these are five undergraduate liberal arts colleges within one square mile of each other. So we're separate institutions, but from Pomona, you can walk to Harvey Mudd in about 10 minutes. Um, and we are able to have these distinct policies and graduation requirements, but share student resources. So there are 1,700 students at Pomona. There are upwards of 6,000 students in the five colleges, giving you the, resource of a, the resources of a mid-size institution. Um, but also you have the sort of close-knit community of a small liberal arts and sciences college. Um, so that is a little bit about where we are located and place. Um, in terms of academic life, something that has been emphasized is this close relationships you have. Um, we were talking about having discussion-based seminars and really focusing on that. The A to one student faculty ratio, 15 is our average class size. Um, not only do you know your professors, your professors know you and they know you well. Um, and it makes all the difference in advising between a professor who can say, oh yeah, you should do an internship or a professor who can say, you're interested in this topic. Maybe you want to try this, this, or this internship. I have two friends in the field. Let me connect you with them. That makes a big difference. That is very important to the faculty on campus um, and making sure students have access to our opportunities. Um, there are three very visible types of opportunities on campuses. Study abroad, which if you're looking to um, be in the United States, you've already got that covered, research and internships. But a big part of any opportunity you see is going to be the community behind it supporting you. Um, Pomona has some really fantastic opportunities for mentorship on campus. Um, so we have a relatively um, significant international student population. We can go to the next slide. Um, and 
We have several formal mentorship programs for many different groups on campus. There's a first generation low income mentorship program. There's the international student mentor program, which is one of our largest. They're there to help you navigate the first couple of years of college. They're also there to share in any grievances or joys. If you arrive on campus and you're like, it's so bizarre that people do this one particular habit, you have people who can sympathize with you and are there to support that. Um, and then finally, as I was mentioning, opportunities are really how you find out what you like and what you don't. Finding a good match for an opportunity is going to be essential. At Pomona, it is our role to make sure you are able to access them. We have programs like Summer Undergraduate Research Program and the Pomona College Internship Program. They're funding programs. Take them anywhere in the world. Do whatever internship or research you think would be most helpful in your educational journey. Um, and you are good to go. In terms of summer undergraduate research program, I can tell you students stay on campus um, to research things like uh, theater and masculinity and why it is that uh, people who identify as men get into theater later. Um, with the internship program, people have gone to work for the Children's Defense Fund. They've worked at the Economics Research Institute in Pakistan. There are a lot of different ways to go forth and see what opportunities fit you. I think I might be coming up on time. So the final piece that I will emphasize is that Pomona is very lucky to be in the financial position we are in. We are able to meet 100% of a student's demonstrated need. Um, this means we cover the cost to be a Pomona as calculated through the CSS profile or the ISFA. Um, and additionally, over 55% of our students receive financial aid. And as of this year, so that average award size is from 2020. As of this year, our average award size is 6, uh, 60,200. Um, it is a commitment we have. We try our best to package without loans. We are not assuming that students would like to be paying any money back once they graduate. Um, so we are able to cover that cost for all of our students, including international students. Um, and I will pass it over to Swarthmore. Awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, so Swarthmore College, um, this is a beautiful photo of our lawn here. Um, just to uh, give you a, an overview here, we are a private liberal arts college. Um, we do offer engineering, which I will talk about in just a moment. That makes us pretty different than other institutions. 1,600 undergraduate students only who are intellectually curious, intellectually vibrant, who ask the how and why questions of the world. Um, about 50% of our students are domestic students students of color, and about 14% are international students as well. So our international student organization, the I-20 organization, is the largest student organization at Swarthmore. Um, further, around 22-23% of our students are first in their family to attend university, like me, and about 21-22% are federally defined as low-income students. So lots of socioeconomic diversity, students are coming from all 50 states and more than 75 different countries, including several from Ghana. Um, we have more than 40 different majors and programs of study. All of those majors are also minors. And we have this historic um, commitment to social justice, civic responsibility, social action. Things like equity, access, inclusion, and affordability are really central to who we are and our mission. And we are only 17 kilometers southwest of the city of Philadelphia. So Philadelphia is the sixth largest city in the United States. Um, we are relatively close by. So you can use Philadelphia as an internship hub, um, explore neighborhoods, explore eateries and dining options, and go to public libraries and art spaces and exhibits, so tons to do in the city of Philadelphia. We're also about a 15 minute drive from the International Airport, so it's relatively easy to get to our campus. If you wanted to go further, uh, you can go to New York City in about an hour and 15 minutes by train. Washington DC is about two hours by train. We also have buses with the Pocono Mountains. We have the Jersey Shore, so ocean and mountains. It's a very geographically diverse region. And what makes it really simple is that we have a train station on our campus and you can zip into Philadelphia in less than 30 minutes. So you have access to a major metropolitan an area, major hub, but you have that quintessential beautiful park-like campus. Lots of trees, lots of bushes and squirrels, right? About half the campus with a crumb wood, so hiking trails, biking trails, walking trails, a creek on campus, an outdoor amphitheater, and the other half of campus are the academic buildings, the residence halls. Um, so this is a picture of our amphitheater where we have first collection, where the entire first year class comes together, talks about their journey to Swarthmore and what that's like, and we have last collection when you graduate from Swarthmore. 
A few things that make us really different. Your first semester at Swarthmore is pass fail. This is credit, no credit. So you're not getting any grades or marks on your transcript in college that first semester for two main reasons. One, we want you to transition to college successfully. So for anyone going to university for the first time, it's a difficult experience. You might be homesick, you might miss your friends or your family. We want to ensure that you can get to know your roommates, join student organizations, make friends, get eight hours of sleep a night, figure out where the coffee shops are and the dining halls and the snack bars, everything that comes with going to college for the very first time without worrying about getting the A, getting the B, getting the C on your transcript. And the second reason is central to our mission. We want you to explore widely. We want you to take classes that you wouldn't otherwise take if you had to get a grade on your transcript. Um, and the second thing that makes us pretty different related to that is we have no cumulative grade point average. So there's no like running total of how well you're doing we don't print that on your transcript because we want yet want that conversation to shift from hey what did you get on that examination to why are you taking this class what are you talking about what excites you about this topic um, I talk a little bit about 40 different majors. We also have interdisciplinary majors, things that span different um, departments like cognitive sciences or Islamic studies. You can also design your own major at Swarthmore if you have really interesting ideas sitting at the intersection of disciplines. And we also have an engineering program. So engineering is one of our most popular majors on our campus. Um, but instead of going to a really large university with a really big engineering program, our our engineering program is about 100 students on campus. You understand the foundational principles of engineering, how these topics interrelate and interconnect with one another so that when you graduate, you can go on to become a biomedical engineer or a mechanical engineer, um, whatever engineering discipline that you wish to be. Um, and a lot of our students pursue further education through a master's or a PhD, and many go directly on to, um, to work. Outside of the classroom, we have about 150 student organizations, teams, clubs, committees. We have 22 Division III sports teams, club sports, intramural sports, six a cappella groups, bands, orchestras, choirs, a full theater program, lots of traditions on campus as well. Um, wish I had, you know, an hour to go through all of this with you, but we only have so much time, but plenty to do on campus. And about 97% of our students will live on campus all four years. Um, so it's, it's that residential community where you get to know your faculty members really well. About 40% of our classes have fewer than 10 students. We have a lot of student support, so we have a cash-free campus, which means that you're not taking any money out of your pocket to pay for academic lectures, film screenings, movies, uh, laundry, printing, all of that is free to Swarthmore students. We recognize also that even if you're on full financial aid, which we offer at Swarthmore, you might still have things that pop up and things that um, might derail you. And so we have an emergency fund in case you have a dental emergency, for example, and you need dental care. Um, we have a textbook affordability program, so you can go to the bookstore and just swipe your student ID and, and purchase your textbooks that way without having to worry about getting a job on campus to pay for those sorts of things. And lots of spaces and programs and people that really want to help you from our first generation. So Center, um, to our intercultural center, Black cultural center, women's resource center, um, and, and um, lots of support there. Um, we also meet 100% of your financial need, and we do so without using loans. So if you need $70,000 US dollars a year, we give you $70,000 US dollars a year. We also are rather are unique in that we don't ask for a financial aid application until you're admitted. So if you're applying, you don't need to fill out one. We recognize that that can be a barrier and it requires a lot of paperwork um, and a lot of angst and, and that sort of thing. So we don't require it. If you're admitted, we will provide you a CSS profile fee waiver and make sure that you have a financial aid package that's in front of you. Um, we also don't charge an application fee for Africa. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, we will provide application fees for anyone who's attending today. And with that, I want to turn it over to Dean at Williams. Thank you very much, Andrew and Phoebe, for your, your great overviews of, of your school. So Williams College, obviously a small private liberal arts and science college as well. We are also located in the Northeast, but a little north and east of where Andrew and our friends are down at Swarthmore. We are in the state of Massachusetts and we are in Western Massachusetts in a beautiful small community called Williamstown nestled in a valley surrounded by beautiful mountains. We are about a three hour drive from Boston and also a three hour drive from New York City. We're right on the border of Vermont and New York State. So about us and who we are with the next slide, you can see we have students from all around the globe. Uh, we have about 2,100 students uh, at 
Williams, and 9% of our students are international students. Uh, this slide needs to be updated. We now have 97 countries represented uh, on our campus uh, as we just started in classes today. So definitely a global community. Uh, we strive for inclusion uh, at Williams and we have a small community and we're located in a small uh, town. So community is really important. There's not a lot of distractions for our students in the location and, and the beauty of, of where we are uh, is special. And moving on to academics. So again, we talked about um, the hallmarks of the liberal arts. Seven to one student professor ratio is one of the lowest you're gonna find in the US. So you're gonna have access to those professors. Um, you can see our other academic uh, demographics here. Um, one thing I want to focus on is our academic division. So I talked about breadth and part of the, the philosophy of the liberal arts. All of our students will have to take three courses in each one of our academic divisions over the four years here. So nine courses, you get to choose, you have flexibility, but it points our students into different areas of study that maybe is not their first choice, but it allows them to learn something new and students fall in love with something that maybe they hadn't taken before, they thought they weren't going to like. And that's the beauty of the liberal arts. There's flexibility within there, but we're asking you to have some breath there to take three courses in each one of these academic divisions before you graduate. And as you can see from the slide, we had 143 different double major combinations, so flexibility and within the curriculum for students to have more than one major as well. The most distinctive part of our academic culture at Williams is the Williams tutorial. So modeled after Oxford University tutorial, we had about 90 tutorials this past academic year, last academic year, uh, out of the 700 courses. So. It is not something that's mandatory. About half of our students will take a tutorial and it's one professor and two students in those. So average class size is 13, but about 12% of our courses are only two students within that. And we offer them across all subject areas and across all academic levels, meaning we have some 100 level courses that are geared for first year students. So anyone can take a tutorial. Uh, it's something that, that you're not gonna find at other schools where it's offered across all subject areas and available for all, all, all grade levels as well. So something distinctive uh, that Williams offers and modeled after the Oxford University program. So research, all of us have talked about research opportunities and, and they're, they're plentiful at Williams. Uh, we also are very fortunate to be well resourced Anyone who does research at Williams gets paid for that research. Most of the research takes place in the summertime. We have about 300 students that do research during the summer. Those students are getting a stipend for that. They're getting housing, they're getting food. And research is happening in all of our areas of study. Uh, you don't have to be a senior or a junior to get involved in research. We have students who are getting involved in research the summer after their first year. And these are some of the examples of some of the programs that we have during the summer months on our campus. And again, our students are first in line for research because we don't have any graduate students on our campus. So what happens after you leave? And it's important to think about this, even though you're not at college yet because your high school life goes by fast, but your college life goes by even faster. We have the oldest alumni society in the United States, and some will say in, in the world as well, celebrated its 200th anniversary last year. So we have an amazing alumni group that is there to help our students with those next steps, with an internship opportunity, connecting with them to find about graduate programs. So you can see some of the results of those um, efforts on our slide. So quickly talking about affordability. Uh, we were the first school and the only school, school too in, in the US um, to have all grant financial aid program. You, you heard Phoebe um, describe um, in, in great detail how financial aid works in the US. So at Williams, if you're on financial aid, it will include a stipend for work study. You won't have to work. You won't have to have a summer earnings income. You won't have a loan. Every bit of financial aid at Williams is grant, which is money that do you not have to pay back. We do meet 100% demonstrated need for all students. And you can see 60% of our international students are receiving aid. 19% of our students are paying nothing at all. So uh, a great program where we're very happy to be um, alone in, in this position right now, where we're the only school that is offering this type of financial aid um, at this time. So that is a quick overview of Williams. Here is some information on our, our social media channels that you can connect with, but thank you for listening.
Thank you, Dean. Um, so for those of you that are tuning in, um, you have contact information um, here. Uh, so this is a little different than our panelists. Uh, we have some coordinators and directors for Africa specifically, and these are your contacts. So Colby Stallings at Pomona College, Marcus Burns at Williams College, and I represent Africa for Swarthmore. So um, if you want to email us um, and do further research, we invite you to participate in our virtual sessions. Um, we list all of the those on our website. So you got five minutes with Pomona. Maybe you want an hour with Pomona. You got five minutes with Williams. You want this. You want a much um, larger program. We all offer um, larger programs that are recorded that you can participate um, live. And so, if you're really interested in any one of us or all three of us, you can do further research on that. So, um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we are going to take some questions at this point. So I'll, I will um, turn it over to Rafia to, to help us coordinate questions. Now, if you have questions, we would love to answer questions that pertain to all three of us, um, uh, pertain to financial aid in the United States, pertain to the admissions process, right? So if you have that burning question about engineering, it's worth more, save that, email me later, or participate in another program with us, because we really want to answer the questions that pertain to all three of us. So Rafiatu, if you can help us or reframe questions, maybe yes. that would be really, really great. Thank you so much. This was really an amazing session. And I am pretty sure that our viewers are enjoying the session. Um, so if you just join us, this is the Education USA information session. And today we are hosting Swatmore College, Williams College, and Pomona. Okay, so we have a number of questions in our chat box and also from our WhatsApp groups. Um, a student wants to find out, what do you look out for in a successful applicant? Yeah, I can probably take that since that was my section earlier today. Um, we are looking for the very best intellectually curious students who are involved who have great perspectives for our campuses. All three of us are different colleges, though. We all have different um, reading processes and different staff members and different people on our campuses. So we might have three slightly different answers. But I think generally speaking, we're looking for students who do great academic work, who are doing very well and have that evidence of doing well for a number of years, right? Does that mean you're the number one student in Ghana? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you always have every single A1 on the West African examinations. We're not expecting perfect people, of course. But we are expecting students to challenge themselves and do really well because our institutions are really going to push you. We're going to ask you questions. We're going to ask you often because the answers to those questions from you specifically really matter to us. So that's kind of the academic portion. Um, we also want students who are going to be involved on our campuses. You heard all of us speak about research and internships yeah. and student organizations. We want students who are not just going to stay in the residence hall or just stay in the back of the class. We want students who are going to be engaged in our process inside and outside of the classroom. And so again, we want that evidence that you have engaged in your community, whatever that might be. Um, and so we really are trying to like winnow this down if we have 100 applications from Ghana, we're going to be looking at those top handful of students. Um, just to be really you know, frank about this, we are selective institutions. We wish we could say yes to a lot more students, but that's just not the case. And so we are looking for students who are what we say flying in all cylinders, whether that's letters of recommendation or your own writing in your essay and really writing compelling applications for us. Wow, thank you so much. A follow-up question. So this one is about finances. Um, a student wants to find out some institutions do require proof of financial support. Um, so the, the student wants to find out, can they apply uh, without providing any proof of financial support? Do you require this for application? Phoebe or Dean, do you want to take that? I, I'm happy to, but I want to make sure. sure I, I can take that. Maybe I can speak generally to that. So many schools are, so you're talking about certificate of finances and, and yeah. that, that um, you know, whatever the finances are in that family, they can afford to go to the school. Mm -hmm. Many schools do not require that in the application okay. process. It happens once students are admitted 
and then they they need that um, information. Sometimes, um, you know, that's part of the visa process for certain countries as well to to show that you can afford to to pay. And, and many times, students will have that financial aid letter that's saying that the school's going to cover all my financial aid. So this is this is part of the visa process. So. Typically, it's not going to be something that they need to have up front, and that will be something that they would need to, to get once they are admitted to a school. There are some schools that might require that earlier on, but, but um, I don't think many liberal arts schools are doing that. That's right. And, and the only thing that I would add is that if something is really confusing to you, lean on us, ask us as colleges questions, ask your Education USA advisor questions. So if, if the website says, we need this specific tax document, and you're like, we don't have that in Ghana, but I could supply <laughs> a letter from my father's employer saying what his income is, that might be okay, right? And so again, Every college is a little different, and you unfortunately have to ask some of those questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Andrew, as part of the requirements, you mentioned recommendation letters and ACEs. So a student wants to find out what makes a recommendation letter or an ACE stand out tall, among others. Yeah, so letters are, letter of recommendations, Letters of recommendation, um, I think what really stands out to us is when we can get to know you um, as much as we can, right? So I read a lot of letters, as you can imagine. We all do. Mm -hmm. All of us collectively read thousands and thousands and thousands of letters of recommendation. Um, and sometimes they're just, they're really short. There are a couple of sentences and um, your teacher might think, oh, I just need to write something and send it off. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of work with your teachers and your schools to sort of talk about this. And what are, what are we expecting um, when we read these letters of recommendation? Um, and I think what would be really helpful is maybe you sit down with your teacher or your school and say, so I'm applying to some selective colleges where they don't have a lot of spaces for getting students students, right? They have mm. just a few spaces. And I would love for you to just talk about me, talk about me in the classroom, talk about how I interact with you, how I interact with maybe my peers. And if you have any stories to share, the admission officers would love to hear those stories. I think maybe a quick conversation about that will give your teachers or give your school counselors some good information, especially if you don't have a history of sending a lot of students app, uh, student applications to the United States. If you're maybe like, I'm the only student this year doing this, they might need a little bit more help. And again, lean on Education USA to have some of those conversations. And I know Education USA does some of these seminars and talks with teachers and a lot of schools and does outreach um, with schools yeah. as well. So, you know, we don't want to penalize you necessarily because your teacher doesn't know what we expect. And, and so we, we're, we do place a lot of emphasis on what you write and what's in your application. But the reality is that, that it's a selective process. Um, and the students who are getting admitted to some of the selective schools generally have strong letters of recommendation. So I think what you can do on your end as a student and having that conversation with the, the people at your school is probably really important. All right, thank you. Okay, so another question, what are some of the top programs in your schools? Oh, Phoebe, I think you're- You said? It's on me, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm happy to start off in that we don't necessarily have a top program in that there's no major on campus where, um, anywhere more than I think nine or 10% of our students are involved with that department. Um, so it's pretty well spread out across the 48 majors and minors, but some of our most popular majors are the ones that students are familiar with while they're in high school and keep that momentum and enthusiasm for once they arrive on campus. So biology, economics, mathematics, um, computer science is one that has grown significantly um, as well as politics and English. Um, but you will find, you know, really passionate majors in the classic and late antique medieval studies department as well. Um, so there are a lot of places to find um, support and it is pretty proportionately distributed across campus as well. And, and at Williams, and I will agree with Phoebe as well. So we, we're not going to talk about top programs as, as maybe one's better than the other, 
um, because we're all of our programs are are, are terrific at our at our schools and and it, it goes by popularity and that changes from from year to year it changes from different demographics you know the the students that are in the U.S. high schools maybe have different interests than students from other parts of the globe as well generally for for Williams uh, and again it's spread out broadly there's not one that dominates as Phoebe mentioned uh, mm. economics English psychology math um, political science. <clears throat> history in there as well, but but all programs are, are, are terrific with, with amazing faculty. You you can't you can't go wrong with with um, what you're looking for. So follow your passions. And if you don't know what those passions are, a liberal arts is a, is a great place to to dabble and figure out you know how that's going to work out for you because for most of us you're not going to choose that major until the end of your second year. So you're not going to come in with that right away. You're not going to jump right you can jump in but you're not going to declare and have to be held to that. So it's not something that you have to decide side right away or think about that or make sure you're checking off the right one because that's one we're looking for. That's not how it works in the liberal arts. Yeah, I, we get this question so often. I want to just echo what my, <laughs> my colleague said. I'm not even going to say what a program could be as a top program at Swarthmore. So I want to I want to do something different, actually. I want to paint just sort of a picture based on my own experience. So I think what we're talking about when we're talking about this education is like the intimate environment of being with faculty who are at the top of their fields, right? It's not about this program is ranked this or this outside newspaper said that that program at Swarthmore is the number one program because honestly that's meaningless right I didn't go to Swarthmore I went to a large university out west when I went into my first class in psychology there were 500 students in stadium style seating listening to one faculty member give a presentation right Yes, I could raise my hand and ask a question, but I didn't have that intimate environment of talking with the faculty member in that class, right? Maybe that class at our institution is 15 students where they're like, oh, let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy today. And let's, let's, let's really get into the details of this. Let me ask you your opinions or what you got from the reading and like, let's have a conversation about that. That's what makes a liberal arts education and the way that you learn so incredibly special. That is really what we're talking about. So I think it's very natural to say, where are the top colleges? What are your top programs? I understand that question and, and it's totally fine that you ask that, but it really is about what type of institution do I want to attend? Okay. Wonderful. All right. So, um, it's a question about COVID. Uh, we all know COVID has changed a lot. So a student wants to find out, has the occurrence of COVID changed your application requirements? For us, it did in a pretty tangible way. We went test optional. Um, so Pomona went test optional um, and have continued the policy. It is true through the fall of 2024 20, at this time, but um, we're going to be looking at like four years of data um, to see how it has impacted and hopefully might be extended at that point. But yes, that was a pretty significant piece um, was the test optional piece. But in terms of like academics, extracurriculars, all of those mm -hmm. things, um, it's really about a person's individual context. It was a devastating period for many people. We are expecting to see it on transcripts and activities lists and everything like that. We are expecting to hear about it in um, counselor and teacher recommendations. Um, it is not something to shy away from in any way. Um, so don't, do not feel self-conscious if COVID makes an appearance in your application because you are certainly not the only one. Same for, for Williams, we, we became test optional at SET, ECT. Okay. Um, back in 2020, and we're going to continue that through 2025. But all the other things that Phoebe mentions are are, are just what we would um, we would want to let students know about how COVID has affected the process for us as well. Yeah, same same for sort more. Okay, great, awesome. All right, so um, this question says, what is CSS profile and ISFAA? What's the difference between the two? And do students need both? Yes. Yeah, I, I can take that um, initially. Okay. So 
Um, the CSS profile is a financial aid form. It's an online form through the college board. So the college board administers the SAT. So if you're taking the SAT, it's the same account. It's the same organization that administers this. They ask lots of questions in an online format, and they're very extensive questions usually. They're about your parents' income, your parents' assets, your income, your assets. If you have siblings at university, lots of questions. You have to sit down with your family. You have to go through this in a really intentional way if the college requires the CSS profile, because that will determine, like Phoebe said, that will determine how much financial aid that you will receive. Now, there's it's sort of like the common application where you're filling out generally some of the same questions just one time, right? You're not going to write your name 10 times for 10 different applications, but every college has their own questions that they also administer. So when you move from one CSS profile to another, even though it's the same, it's the same portal, you will have sometimes different questions. Once you get to the end of the CSS profile, you'll need to submit the CSS profile to each individual college, and that costs money. So you have an, an individual fee for every college that you need, where you need to submit this form to. Some colleges will offer waivers. So they'll give you a waiver code and you can submit that without paying for that because that might be a financial hardship for you. Some colleges will say, you don't need to fill that out right now. Actually, instead, fill out the International Student Financial Aid Application or the ISFA. And it, it, there's different iterations of this. There's a new form, but basically it's a, it's a PDF. So you fill this out. It asks a lot of the same questions, but maybe not in the same way, but it, it generally asks, you know, what, how is your family made up and how much money do you have in your savings account and what, what is your income and how much does your family intend to contribute to your education while you're at university. And generally speaking, you can submit this without paying any fee. This is a free application that you can submit to colleges. Some colleges require both of these things. We don't require either of these things right now until you're admitted. So you can see, even with the three of us, we're actually pretty different, even though we have very similar financial aid policies. Um, so that really gets to the heart of you have to go in and make a spreadsheet and say, I'm applying to these 10 colleges, and these are the requirements, and these are the deadlines, and ask those questions. Um, I wish I could also say that those are the only th two things you need to do for financial aid, and that's generally sure. not true. You also so sometimes have to submit that documentation that might be tax documents, that might be work slips or pay slips. Every financial aid office is going to be different. So um, reach out and ask those questions. We have a full, all three of us have dedicated financial aid staffs that get these questions often. I know all three of us, I'm sure, have extensive websites where we answer a lot of these questions for you. And then um, go to our websites join our mailing lists or contact, you know, forms, and we'll send you emails about this sort of thing and read your emails and pay attention to your emails because we design them specifically for you. But um, I'm sure we could do a whole presentation on financial aid as well. That's the quick sort of snapshot of it. Thank you. Okay, so my last question before the session ends. Um, this one is about academic advisors. Do you have academic advices and how do I get in touch with one? Our last question. Do you have academic I can advices? Take it, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think there's an easy answer to that. So, yes, you will definitely have an academic advisor. Um, you'll have an advisor before you even start at your mm -hmm. school. So if you are admitted to whatever school that is, your, your advisor is going to contact you in the summer to, to explain how things work at the school to help you with thinking about your courses that you're going to pick for that fall. So you'll have an academic advisor at all the schools until you choose a major, and then you'll have an advisor in your specific major that focus on you know, what, what's the pathway in that major um, in, in different concentrations within a major. So they explain how it works within that major. You'll have an, ac you'll have a, an academic advising center, um, for lack of a better term, on each campus that will have um, other resources. So it's not just going to be one person. There's going to be a whole office that is going to be there to support students academically, and they'll have access to tutors, a writing center, 
all these other things, some will be geared towards certain majors, maybe for math or something analytical. So you'll have a host of people that will be there to support you. And that's the beauty of the liberal arts. We have a, we have a lot of resource for a small amount of students. So you can get that hands-on assistance uh, that you need. And some of that might be um, upper class students that have been in the classes that will tutor you. So there's, there's a wide range um, of, of academic support. There's also social support there too. So counseling centers and social psychological support that, that helps um, with students who are, who are managing other, other variables but also international support for students that, that are dealing with things that are different than somebody that, that just comes from right down the street or, or from another state in the US, you're gonna have an international office, wherever they call that on the campus that is gonna help you with all things related to coming to another culture, um, visa things, setting up a bank account, insurance, all these other things. So academic support is one piece of it, but there are a whole lot of support that's there on many levels, particularly at, at a small liberal arts college. Thank you so much. This has really been um, an educative session and I'm very sure that our viewers have really benefited from this. If you want to get in touch with any of those colleges, um, they have their email addresses in this video so you can reach out to them directly or reach out to education usa we do remind you that we are your number one stop shop when it comes to us higher education thank you so much for joining today's session so we meet again it's a bye bye